Welcome to the Nano Networking and Molecular Communication module of the Colibri project. My name is Shukru Kuran from Boğaziçi University. In this video, we will be covering the first part of the introductory level of the module. We will be talking on the reasoning behind this new communication field and research area. In other words, we will be answering the question, why do we need nano networking and molecular communication? Since the inception of computers and the transistor technology in particular, there is an ever-increasing need for processing power. In order to accommodate this need, researchers focus on finding methods for building transistors in smaller and smaller sizes while being economically feasible, which is called the miniaturization process. With every new processor generation, we are having smaller processors which enable us to build more powerful devices. These more powerful devices in turn lead us to newer applications which cannot work under the old slower processors. After a while, these newer applications become more mainstream, much more complicated and bigger in size. Then again, we are one more time required to find methods to further miniaturize processors to cope up with this new application demand. In the last two decades, we have seen this trend in the consumer market devices starting from the desktop computers to laptops and with the advent of the mobile devices to smartphones and tablets. Actually, this trend is not something new to the last two decades. Gordon E. Moore, the co-founder of the Intel Corporation, has observed this trend in his 1965 paper. He stated in his paper, the complexity for minimum component costs has increased at a rate of roughly a factor of two per year. Certainly over the short term, this rate can be expected to continue, if not to increase. Over the longer term, the rate of increase is a bit more uncertain although there is no reason to believe it will remain nearly constant for at least 10 years. In short, this statement, which is popularly known as the Moore's Law, refers to the trend that the number of transistors in a dense integrated circuit doubles approximately every two years. Looking back from today, we see that for the last 50 years this law has proved itself to be quite correct the microprocessor technology more or less followed this observation. The most advanced Intel processor of the early 70s, 4004 and 8008, have around 2300 and 3500 transistors respectively. One decade later, Intel launched its 8086 and 8088 series with around 30,000 transistors. This trend continued through the 80s with different architectures and coming up to the first Pentium processors around 1995 with 3.1 million transistors. So it makes the first Pentium transistor having nearly 1000 times the number of transistors of the 8008 processors. From then on, the transistor count of both the Intel and AMD processors continued increasing and first surpassing the 10 million barrier in 1998 the 100 million barrier in 2002 and 1 billion barrier around 2010. Okay, so looking at these numbers, we can say that everything is looking pretty good on the microprocessor technology front, right? Well, kind of. The Intel Haswell core of 2013 has 1.4 billion transistors in each core and the main integrated circuit of, of iPhone 6, the Apple A8, has roughly 2 billion transistors. So considering 1 billion transistors per microprocessor in 2010, according to Moore's law, the current microprocessors should be having something like 4 to 5 billion transistors. But these numbers are telling another story altogether. Unlike the 90s and 2000s, recently it has become much harder to reduce the size of a transistor and keep it economically feasible. The main issues preventing the microprocessor research in building smaller transistors are mainly threefold. The inability to dissipate heat from transistors in an efficient manner, increased power consumption, and current leakage. It is argued that we might have reached the limit of the Moore's Law's observation. In the wake of this limitation, the research for achieving higher processing power has been divided into two main groups. On one hand, Researchers are working on finding alternative materials and components for building smaller and cheaper microprocessors. On the other hand, microprocessor companies started utilizing parallelization efforts for
for increasing the processing power of the microprocessors. Therefore, since the beginning of the 2000s, we are hearing much more about multi-core processors, first in desktop and laptop computers, and recently in mobile devices like smartphones. Unlike the single-core processor architectures, there is a critical communication component in multi-core processor architectures. This is especially an important issue when we are talking about processors with lots of cores like 12, 20 cores. In recent years, there is also an increased interest for medical systems. Medical systems are usually divided into two categories, intrusive and non-intrusive ones. Most of the current medical applications rely solely on non-intrusive systems that operate outside the body or the living tissue in question. However, in order to have a greater control and capability in medical and healthcare applications, intrusive systems that work from inside the living organisms are needed. A key issue of these intrusive systems are to be biocompatible with the tissue in question. This means that they should not harm or be harmed by the living organism in question. Albeit they are very small in size, silicon-based devices have severe biocompatibility issues. They can cause problems to the tissue when they are inside the body, and also they have huge energy issues being limited by their initial battery size. In order to overcome these issues, genetically engineered devices like programmed cells or cell-like constructs are needed. According to recent studies, these programmed cells are expected to be very limited in terms of processing power. Therefore, similar to the paralyzation problem, a need for an efficient communication system is also crucial for these kind of devices for them to achieve macro-scale results. After giving some amount of backstory and elaborating on the underlying core issues driving the nano-networking research, let us define two key terms that constitute the nano-networking research. In the context of nano-networking and molecular communication, we usually call each device capable of communicating with other devices and nanomachine. One of the pioneers of the nanonetworking research, Ian Oculdes, defines the nanomachine as A nanomachine is a device consisting of nanoscale components, able to perform a specific task at nano level, such as communicating, computing, data storing, sensing, and or actuation. Going one step further, when we are talking about nanonetworking systems, we focus on human designed systems for communicating at or with the nanoscale. So at least one component of the whole communication process should be in nanoscale for a system to be called a nanonetworking system. Also, the underlying physical properties and principles in the system should be specific to the nanoscale. Based on this definition, there are currently two main approaches for nanonetworking in the related literature. The nanoelectromagnetic communication the NEC and the molecular communication, the MC. The difference between these two approaches are NEC focuses on systems with more or less traditional wireless communication components, whereas MC deals with systems inspired from biological intercell and intracell communication mechanisms. In NEC, the devices or nanomachines are usually electromechanical devices like microchips with silicon based or graphene based structures. The environment in question is generally outside living organisms, and the communication medium that is considered is electromagnetic waves. In MC, on the other hand, the nanomachines are always biological entities like programmed cells or bacteria. In contrast with the NEC approach, the environment in question is generally inside the living organisms, and the communication medium is focused on molecules, ions, and similarly nanoscale objects. As you might imagine, both approaches require a lot of interdisciplinary research. Research on NEC systems usually requires a lot of information and effort from the domains of physics and mechanical engineering, in addition to classical telecommunications engineering. On the other hand, the research on MC systems are interdisciplinary efforts between the fields of biophysics, biochemistry, molecular engineering, and classical telecommunications engineering. So we have covered the reasoning behind the nanonetworking and molecular communications research in this video. We will be continuing with the possible applications and key research challenges on these topics in the second video of the introductory level.
Here you can see the reference of this video. Thank you for listening and see you next time.